I was eight or nine years old when I used to come here to the Norfolk Broads on the River Bure, sailing and rowing with my father. And I think it was the outline of that church tower of Beeler against the sky, which gave me a passion for churches, so that every church I've been past since, I've wanted to stop and look in. Norwich, which includes most of Norfolk and a little bit of Suffolk. What would you be, you wide East Anglian sky, without church towers to recognize you by? What centuries of faith in flint and stone wait in this watery landscape all alone? To antiquaries, objects of research. To the bored tourist, just another church. The varied Norfolk Towers could also be a soothing sight to mariners at sea. This is Cly next to the sea. The sea is now quite a long way off. It's a tiny place, but it's got an enormous church. They must have had hopes of it being very much bigger. And look at that porch, built, I should think, about 1430. Very delicately done, almost another church in itself. And slapped onto it, very coarsely, a sundial. Time suddenly stuck into eternity. Look at that, for vastness and light. Light falling on carved Norfolk oak, gone silvery grey with age. And towards the light come out the nightmare figures of marsh and forest, earth-bound creatures struggling up the bench ends. They know they can never reach the winged celestial hosts here in the roof at Napton, The finest of all the wood carving is in the neighboring parish of Trunch. It exalts the very first sacrament. You have brought this child to baptism. You stand in the presence of God and his church. You must now make the Christian profession in which she is to be baptized and in which you will bring her up. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? Baptism by water, the first armor we put on against the assaults of hate, greed, and fear on our journey back to eternity. Do you believe and trust in his Holy Spirit? Cherry Ann, your godparents make promises on your behalf, and the village of Trunch bears witness. <coughs> Cherry Ann, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I sign you with the sign of the cross, to show that you must not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified 
and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil, and to continue to fight safe for souls and servants unto your life's end. First steps on the journey. At Mattishall, they have Sunday school on Wednesday afternoon. The little people, as they call them, clutching their tambourines and triangles, come to hear the old story told anew. You've all seen this story before, haven't you? It's about some sheep. It's a story Jesus told about some lovely sheep. And there's the man looking after his sheep. Just like Mr. Faircloth, he got lots and lots and lots of sheep, and he was very fond of all the sheep, but then one of them went and got lost. It got stuck in a hedge somewhere. It got its horns all stuck up so it couldn't get out of the way. And the poor shepherd was very worried because he'd lost one, and so he started to look. He looked here, and he looked there. Couldn't find it anywhere, and he was getting very worried almost thinking about going home because it was getting dark, and then, suddenly, he heard a little noise, and there it was. He found it. And he lifted it up and took it home and was so happy. And here's the last picture. Jesus tells us he loves us just as much as that one little sheep that was lost. And if we get lost, he'll do anything he can to find us. So that's nice, isn't it? Each generation makes itself heard. The past cries out to us even when we try to smother the cries. Medieval saints peer at us through godly warnings put over them by pious Elizabethans, who had more use for the written word than the painted picture. We can help the past come through. A hundredth of an inch at a time, Miss Pauline Plummer is revealing the secrets of the chancel screen at Ranworth, and soon will show it in its medieval glory. In the 15th century, Norwich was famous for its painters. They delighted in herbs and flowers and living creatures. The lithe and feathered figure of the Archangel Michael is by no provincial hand. It's rather a masterpiece. The Norwich artists also painted on glass, and light came into every Norfolk church through golden late medieval windows. Men hate beauty, they think it's wicked. Self-righteous church wardens delighted in smashing it. Village boys flung stones, storms did the rest. Today, the famous Norwich glass is nearly all jumbled fragments. A few whole windows survive. Here's where the artists worked, the city of Norwich, down in the valley of the Wensum. It's a city of cobbled alleys and winding footpaths. 
It has more medieval churches within its walls than London, York and Bristol put together. Remember Norwich. Round the corner, down the steps, over the bridge, up the hill, there's always a church. And grandest of all, St. Peter Mancroft. So large that sometimes people mistake it for the cathedral. The city wears its cathedral like a crown, a coronal of flying buttresses supporting walls of glass. The Normans started it. The stone was brought over the sea from France to build and adorn the cathedral church of the holy and undivided trinity. It draws the whole diocese towards it. And in its cloisters, made for contemplation, mothers and grandmothers, vicars and rectors, from the towns and villages of the Diocese of Norwich, gather together for the annual festival of the Mother's Union. Boardswell greets Stratton Strawless, Potter Hyam is on terms with little snoring. North Creek sits beside Melton Constable. And for everyone, there's the chance to meet the bishop. Here we've got Bishop Salmon's porch, about 1320. Now, that was merely the entrance to my dining hall. So as opposed to having your lunch in the cloisters, or as today, uh, sitting out here in the garden, we would have given you an, an enormous sit-down lunch from there to there, the whole stretch of that was the bishop's dining hall. We weren't married in those days, darling. So that... <laughs> <laughs> it was before bishops were allowed to have wives, so we weren't married in those days. Maurice Wood, diocesan bishop of Norwich. When not entertaining, he's Maurice Norvik, father in God to the clergy. Receive this cure of souls which is both mine and thine, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The bishop institutes a new rector to the living of Holt in North Norfolk. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for evermore. Amen. By the laying on of hands, the bishop commits to the priest the spiritual care of the parish. With every parish church, there's a house, rectory or vicarage, usually beside the churchyard. I think you probably need money of your own to be rector of great snoring, because the rectory house is a Tudor palace with moulded autumn-coloured brick and elaborate chimney stacks, and the date about 1525. It's the usual practice now, though, to sell big rectories and build labour-saving villas in their place. At Western Longville, in Georgian days, Parson Woodford wrote his worldly diaries full of good dinners. The present rector types the parish magazine. We send belated birthday greetings to Mr Walter Pardon of Western Longville, who reached the splendid age of 89 years on February the 17th. Little Johnny Arthurton, age eight and a half years, broke his leg on February the 17th. Bad luck. We hope that you will get well soon, Johnny. It's only a rumor, of course, but there is talk of a sponsored streak for church funds. By whom, we wonder? Not, I think, by members of the parochial church council at Leatheringset, the PCC. Its meeting this evening 
in the church hall with the rector in the chair. Thank you very much then. We will now proceed. May I have the minutes of the last PCC meeting, please? Minutes of the meeting held on January 29th, 1974. Present, the Reverend A.M. Gamble in the chair, Mrs. English, Mr. Fish, Mrs. Hall, Miss Cousins Hardy, Lady Harrod, Mrs. Hyde, Mr. and Mrs. Douglas King, Mr. Lewis, Brigadier, and Mrs. Phelps, Mrs. Sadler, Mrs. Sinclair. Commander Sinclair sent a written report stating that the external contract work had been completed, subject to a test of the efficacy of the repairs and improvements to the porch water head. It was noted that it had been discovered that there were no foundations to the church tower. If it isn't the tower, it's the transept or the north porch, and the answer is usually a fate to raise another few pounds. We can rely on the parish to rally round. Ladies and gentlemen, just a moment, please. First of all, I want to thank Mrs. Lestrange and everybody who has helped her to arrange this afternoon's event and to thank you for coming. I think most people have got a particularly soft spot for South Raynham and its church. I know I have. And uh, it's very nice to see all the friends coming to, to help us to raise a little bit of money to keep it going for another thousand years or two. <laughs> And now, let battle commence. <laughs> God bless the Church of England, the rectory lawn that gave a trodden space for that bazaar that underpinned the nave. We must dip into our pockets, for our hearts are full of dread at the thought of all the damage since the roof was stripped of lead. Now we got the star attraction for today. The picture, not me. Now what may I say for this? Someone start me five pound. Five pound I'm big. Five. Six. Six. Seven, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> and advance on ten pounds. Do you mean another Tony? Try half. That's always worth a try. And it's always worth a try to get the key, however remote the church. In fact, the remoter the better. There's more chance of its being left unspoiled. St. Mary Beeler in the Valley of the Wenson. Look. This is a perfect example of a church in a park in the time of Jane Austen. The woodwork is all of oak. Notice that altarpiece with the creed, the commandments and the Lord's Prayer painted on it. And here is a three-decker pulpit in full sail. This is where the parish clerk said Amen at the end of the prayers and announced the name of the hymn tune or the psalm tune. Here, a gentle staircase leads to the middle deck. And this is where the minister, as he was called, read the holy offices of morning and evening prayer and the lessons. And if he was in the mood, or it was the fourth Sunday in the month or something like that, he would ascend to the top deck to preach a sermon. And from here, the parson could survey his whole parish. In the big box pew there, the squire from the hall slumbering while a fire crackled in the grate. The large farmers in the pews in front, the cottagers and lesser tenantry behind. All by country custom, in their place, in the church, by law established.
the cottagers and lesser tenantry would have had a good long walk by field and footpath to the isolated parish church of St. Margaret Felbrig. The squire would have had a gentle stroll. It is in the park of the big house. I wonder who fall to their knees here today. Oh, the new cottage industry, brass rubbing. Memorial brasses to former generations of squires of Felbrig and their ladies. Medieval effigies that tell us nothing of the people they represent. They're so calm and bland and self-controlled. Outlined there, as large as life, Sir Simon and Lady Margaret Felbrig. He a garter knight and she a cousin of the Queen. It must have been the day of days, the day they took their vows. From this day forward, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, till death us do part, according to God's holy law, according to God's holy law, and there too, and there too, I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. I, Celia. I, Celia. Take thee, Nigel. Take thee, Nigel. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And there too. And there too. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. <laughs> Bringing the changes, treble bell to tenor, unites young and old. Captain of the tower and 60 years a ringer, Billy West. Oh, that's music in the air, that's music in the air. But once I get hold of it, I suppose that's like smoking cigarettes. Once I get hold of it, that's a, that's a drug. You can't get rid of it. There's something about it, I don't know what it is, but it go anywhere for it. If I went somewhere where there were some bells, I'd go crazy, I know I should. Bells are life to me. I mean, uh, that never seem a Sunday to me. If uh, if we don't hear the bells, that never seems Sunday. If you can't hear church bells going, I hear a deep, sad undertone in bells, which calls the Middle Ages back to me. From Prime to Compline, the monastic hours echo in bells along the windy marsh and fade away. They leave me to the ghosts which seem to look from this enormous sky upon the ruins of a grandeur gone, St. Bennet's Abbey by the river Bure, now but an archway and a Georgian mill, a lone memorial of the cloistered life. Alone? No, not alone. Serene, secure, the sisters of All Hallows Ditchingham in this brick convent, for over a century now, have taught and trained the young and nursed the sick and founded rescue homes, a homely, practical community. Their souls are fed with daily Eucharists. 
You see the impress there upon the bread. You see the impress also in their lives. <laughs> their motto, Semper Orantes, Semper Laborantes, always at prayer and always at their work. An Anglican convent in East Anglia. A place to think of when the world seems mad with too much speed and noise. A pleasant place to come to for retreat. There's really not much risk of being stung. Always at prayer and always at their work. Just as some people are holy, so are places. They draw us to them, whether we will or not. In the misty past, in the 1920s and 30s, people came to Norfolk by train, by steam, Great Eastern, and more locally, by Midland and Great Northern Joint. They came on pilgrimage by train. Faith enlightened, full of hope, and on the way to Walsingham. This is all that remains of the railway track that carried all those pilgrims to Walsingham. And what's become of the station? It's the Orthodox Church. The Orient, come to East Anglia. To this country town, where in 1061, forgive my mentioning dates, the Lady of the Manor saw the Virgin Mary, Mother of God. Then medieval pilgrims, peasants, kings, in thousands thronged to England's Nazareth. The cult has been revived in modern times suburbanized, perhaps. The Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, 1930s red brick Romanesque. But inside is the goal of all the pilgrims, and very peculiar it is. I wonder if you'd call it superstitious, here in this warm, mysterious, holy house, the figure of Our Lady and her child. Or do you think that forces are around, strong, frightening, loving, and just out of reach, but waiting, waiting somewhere to be asked? And is that somewhere here at Walsingham? Is your teacher of evangelists, the mighty Lord of our Lady of Walsingham, branch of the Lord 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 from the stairs of the devil, she is your son of Almighty the Virgin God, Mary. She is your most lovable. She is your most wonderful. She is your mighty God. The water bubbles from the holy well. By water, we were brought into the church. By water, we are blessed along the way. I've seen processions like this in Sicily, and you can see them in the streets of Malta, too. But it's an exotic flowering of the C of E here in a Norfolk garden. The Anglican church has got a bit of everything. It's very tolerant, and that is part of its strength.
I don't want to lose any. When I get back, lots of you sheep. Uh, goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Father. Now, try and be good. We come next year. Well, we will try. And then we'll make you better. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell to the pilgrims, here come the tourists. Sandringham is the Queen's country estate. The parish church is used both by the villagers and the royal family. It seems appropriate to arrive in style. Originally, says the guidebook, Sandringham Church had little or nothing to distinguish it from any village church in Norfolk. Well... At first glance, it rather reminds me of the wee Kirk of the Heather in Hollywood. Those silver panels on the pulpit. That jewel-encrusted Bible. But in fact, it's very Edwardian. For here worshipped King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. The ornate furnishings, this altar of solid silver, were given by Mr. Rodman Wanamaker, a very rich American admirer of our royalty. Sandringham Church has its homely touches too. Of all the details in this church, I think this is my favorite. This figure here. You can tell by the swirls and the curves who the sculptor was. He was Sir Alfred Gilbert, who designed, you'll remember, Eros in Piccadilly Circus. In Sandringham, he's done the figure of St. George. I weighed my way alone, no tourists near, through last year's autumn leaves to Bhutan's haunting, weird Victorian church. Its pinnacles, outlined against the sky, seem outsized pinnacles. Copies of others elsewhere, but they look so big, I fear the church will topple with their weight. A rich Victorian rector paid for them and paid for all the stained glass windows, too. No painful crucifixions here. The heavenly choir, in Victorian dress, makes joyful music unto the Lord of Hosts. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, but practice first in the rectory at Martham, between the broads and the sea. I come here troubles only, verse 2. from sin released, behold, that octave jump. Could we just, uh, what are the words? <laughs> behold, the word behold. Behold. Is that an E? Thank you. No, just, just an E. E. 
Behold again. Behold. Now open your mouths this time and hit that top note. Behold. From the beginning, verse two. Meanwhile, in his room above, the rector, Father Cooling, model engineer, oils his parish wheels, and indeed, they run themselves most smoothly. Everywhere, church choirs prepare for Easter. Wyndham's Norman Abbey is the town's parish church. And in this century, Sir Ninian Comper made the East Wall a lofty reredos of sculptured gold. Scale is the secret of its majesty. Scale was Comper's secret. In 1914, they let him loose in this plain old country church. He turned it into a treasure house. The golden church of Lound, Suffolk, in the Diocese of Norwich. Gold on the font cover to emphasize the sacrament of baptism, entry into the church. Gold on the screen to veil the mystery of Holy Communion at the High Altar. I knew Comper. He died only a few years ago, aged 96. And he looked rather like those advertisements for Colonel Saunders in Kentucky Chicken advertisements, little white pointed beard. And uh, he spoke in a very lardy da manner, my walk, don't you know, in that church. And his walk in this church is marvelous. I think this is what a late medieval English church probably looked like when it was new. Colour very important. Saints, angels and symbolic figures everywhere. Compo was much influenced by the colour and decoration of Spanish, Sicilian and Greek churches. He didn't mind about style. Sometimes he mixed classic with Gothic, that he called unity by inclusion. As I look through this rude screen, I can see the colors of the altar hangings. Pink predominates. It's called compa pink, and he had it specially made in Spain. He used to buy scarlet silk and there have it bleached in the sun till it was just the shade he wanted. Incomparable, as people used to say. A church should pray of itself with its architecture, said Comper. It is its own prayer and should bring you to your knees when you come in. But there's another way. At his ordination, every Anglican priest promises to say, morning and evening prayer daily. The vicar of Flodden has rung the bell for matins each day 
for the past 11 years. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture more with us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, uh, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty it doesn't Lord, matter Father, that there's no one there. It doesn't matter when they do not come. The villagers know the parson is praying for them in their church. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no help in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto them. In some churches, all prayer has ceased. St. Benedict's Norwich is a tower alone. But better let it stand, a lighthouse beckoning to a changing world. St. Edmund Fishergate, a store for souls of shoes. Once it was working for the souls of men. Churches are what make Norwich different. A church for every Sunday of the year, they used to say of it. A use for every church is what we say today. St. Lawrence here spacious and filled with mitigated light. The matchless words of the Book of Common Prayer once rolled along these walls. Now young artists use it for a studio. Better that than let the building fall. Artists came to St. Mary Coslany too. In this church, John Sell Cotman, the Norfolk watercolour painter, was baptised. And here, Crome the artist was married. The present congregation is well upholstered. It is all stored here for a charity. A use for every church, a thought not new. 400 years ago, St. Helen's Norwich became a hostel and a hospital. Men in the nave, ladies in the chancel, the parish church in between. This is the upper floor of the chancel, the Eagle Ward. And here you can be cared for till you die. And should we let the poor old churches die? Do the stones speak? My word, of course they do. Here in the midst of life, they cry aloud. You've used us to build houses for your prayer. You've left us here to die beside the road. Christ, Son of God, come down to me and save. How fearful and how final seems the grave. Only through death can resurrection come. Only from shadows can we see the light. Only at our lowest comes the gleam. Help us, we're all alone and full of fear. Drowning, we stretch our hands to you for aid. And wholly unexpectedly, you come. The most tolerant and all-embracing church. Wide is the compass of the Sea of Eve. The Smith's Knoll Lightship is the farthest point of the Norwich Diocese, 22 miles out to sea. The Reverend Morris Chant, chaplain of the missions to seamen in Great Yarmouth, comes aboard to meet the men, to see if there are any problems, and to be there just in case he's needed. He distributes the missions magazine and pastoral greetings. On inland waters, Canon Blackburn, chaplain of the Norfolk Broads, summons the floating members of his flock to Easter service. Well, this is very, very nice, but a bit rough. <laughs> yes, quite. Yes. I'm the vicar of Randworth and the chaplain of the Broads. And I thought I'd just like to come and give you a welcome. Have you been here before? 
you know Randworth Church. You've been up the tower, seen the view. We've got a leaflet over. My wife's given you a leaflet. Easter service, almost 10 in the morning. It's a Series 3 communion, and uh, you come in your sailing clothes and bring everyone, whether they're confirmed or not. They're all very welcome. If you happen to be here staying over the day, we're going to have an open hour service in the evening. And it'll be jolly cold, but the bishop's coming, so it'll be rather fun. <laughs> Easter Day. Dawn over the easternmost tip of Britain, Ness Point, Lowestoft. At six o'clock in the morning, led by the band of the Salvation Army, all churches join in the first Easter service and greet the rising sun. Peaceful their lives are, calm and unsurprising, the almshouse ladies here at Castle Rising, and suited to the little brick-built square, the Jacobean hats and cloaks they wear. See from the separate rooms in which they dwell, each one process. The warden pulls the bell, fingers and knees not yet too stiff to pray, and thank the Lord for life this Easter day. <laughs> Bells of St. Peter Mancroft loudly pealing fill the whole city with an Easter feeling. Is risen today, is risen today, they plead, where footpath, lane, and steep up alley lead. Across the diocese, from tower to tower, the church bells exercise compelling power. Come all to church, good people, hear them say. Come all to church, today is Easter day. Over our vicar, we may not agree. He seems too high to you, too low to me. But still the faith of centuries is seen in those who walk to church across the green. The faith of centuries is in the sound of Easter bells that ring all Norfolk round. And though for church we may not seem to care, it's deeply part of us. Thank God it's there. <laughs> 